As the bloody Civil War came to a close, slavery was formally abolished in the U.S. in 1865. With this amendment, many African Americans who were born into slavery in the South were free for the first time in their lives. Richard Toller was among this group. He was born around 1837 on a plantation in Lynchburg, Virginia. After the war, he went on to work as a blacksmith, stonemason, and carpenter, according to interview excerpts gathered by the Federal Writers Project. Richard Toller was one of the most eloquent of all. He talked about never learning to read or write and never having money. He wasn't allowed to have parties, and he literally said, I never had good times until I was free. That's Richard Cahan, co-author of the book River of Blood, American Slavery from the People Who Lived It. The new release chronicles nearly 100 profiles of those that had been enslaved in the South. It's a first-hand look at slavery. You know, we all learn about slavery, or most of us learn about slavery in schools and in high school, and it's oftentimes kind of couched in economic and political terms, but this is the first time I'd ever come across first-hand accounts, and I think that's its real value. Each profile features a photo and a short excerpt from an interview with that person conducted by the Federal Writers Project during the late 1930s. The project was created by the federal government after the Civil War in an effort to capture the raw experiences of those formerly enslaved. So this was about 70 years after the end of the Civil War. And the people that were interviewed were at least 70 if they were babies, but they were in their 80s and 90s and even some were 100 years old. And they talked about their experiences and their thoughts. And one thing that's very unusual about this book is that we've used photographs, portraits of formerly enslaved people to go with their words so that you really get a sense of the power of their words and their pictures together. The dozens of writers that made up the Federal Writers Project interviewed nearly 3,000 formerly enslaved men and women. Out of this number, the interviewers captured 300 grainy black and white portrait photos of their subjects. Most of the interviewers and most of the interviewer slash photographers were white. And here these people were being asked by white people for the first time in their lives what they felt like, what they experienced. They were being honored and valued. And then at the end of this interview, they were being asked to pose for photographs. And I think that many of the 96 people who are on the book really took this moment to make a statement about their resilience and their pride. So many of them are pictured in, men were pictured in suits, but on the whole, people were just wearing what they were wearing. But they're always sitting up ramrod straight, or even if they have a cane, they're standing very stately. And I think they somehow, and I don't know how, understood the importance of both giving their testimony, which was essential, and being photographed. One of the women interviewed and photographed was Marianne Burleson Patterson. She was born into slavery around 1840 in Louisiana and forcibly relocated to Texas after she and her mother were both sold to a slaveholder near Austin. At the time of her interview, she said that she doesn't know exactly how old she is, but she could be anywhere between 97 to 102 years old. That picture of Marion Burleson Patterson, it's a woman just standing with a hoe in front of her, and she's got on a, a long apron and very beautiful dress, and not dress, but work clothes. And she was born around 1840, so when she was interviewed, she was very close to 100 years old, and she's still hoeing the land. Despite the horrors and hardships of slavery, Burleson Patterson went on to marry and raised 15 children on her family's farm. The Federal Writers Project found so many stories similar to hers, stories of resilience, strength, and the will to start over again. This one woman, Betty Simmons, was talking about how she was very glad that the Civil War ended when it did because the slaveholders were about to put her three-year-old boy into the field, and she just wrote, they took them young. And Felix Haywood, another person, talked about how some African Americans, a few of them, most people stayed on the plantations, but a few wanted to move north. His words are so brilliant. They, he just wrote, they seemed to want to get closer to freedom so they'd know what it was, like it was a place or a city. Many who were formerly enslaved remained in the South after the end of the Civil War and found work nearby. They had to start their new lives with absolutely nothing, and obviously with, in the South especially, so much hatred directed towards them. The end of the war was a very difficult moment for African Americans who had been enslaved. 
very few could read or write because they were prohibited from reading and from owning writing instruments. And they weren't equipped to do much more than to live a life on a farm, a hardworking life on a farm. So at the end of the war, it was not surprising that many people, most people, stayed close to the plantation where they had been held or nearby because oftentimes slaveholders agreed to pay them. It was a very small amount of money, but they agreed to pay them and also provide for their food and their housing. And it was a difficult choice to stay, I'm sure, on plantation, but I think that it was a choice that many people saw as a practical choice, especially after the first couple of years at the end of the Civil War. But by the 20th century, thousands started migrating north to cities including Chicago, Detroit, and New York in search of a new life and greater opportunities. They pushed onward in hopes of a better tomorrow. These words and portraits gathered from formerly enslaved men and women and cemented in history are vital to remembering this dark period in American history. To see some of the photos featured in the book River of Blood, American Slavery from the People Who Lived It, visit viewpointsradio.org. You can also purchase the new release at cityfilespress.com or on Amazon. For more behind the scenes, check out Viewpoints Radio on Instagram and Twitter. This segment is written and produced by Amira Zaveri. Studio production by Jason Dickey. I'm Marty Peterson. Viewpoints returns in just a moment. About a million Americans have Parkinson's disease, and many are treated with levodopa carbidopa therapy, but about half of them will experience off episodes when Parkinson's disease symptoms return between doses of these medications. The FDA has approved Norian's Istradevalon, a prescription medicine used with levodopa and carbidopa to treat adults with Parkinson's disease experiencing off episodes. Dr. Robert Hauser of the University of South Florida says, During off episodes, symptoms including difficulty walking return which can impact patients. Nurians is the first and only treatment of its kind that works differently. In clinical trials, Nurians significantly decreased the amount of off time the patients experienced and increase the amount of time patients had good symptom control between doses. Norians may cause serious side effects, including uncontrolled sudden movements, dyskinesia, hallucinations, and other symptoms of psychosis, as well as compulsive behaviors and an inability to control them. The more common side effects of Norians include uncontrolled movements, dyskinesia, dizziness, constipation, nausea, hallucinations, and problems sleeping, insomnia. If you or your family notice that you are developing any new or unusual symptoms or behaviors, talk to your health care provider. These are not all the possible side effects of Norian's. Call your doctor for medical advice about side effects. You may report side effects to FDA at 1-800-FDA-1088. Before you take Norian's, tell your health care provider about all your medical conditions, including if you have a history of dyskinesia, have reduced liver function, and smoke cigarettes or use other tobacco products. Tell your health care provider about all the medicines you take, including prescription and over-the-counter medicines, vitamins, and herbal supplements. Norians may affect the way other medicines work, and other medicines may affect how Norians works. To get more information about Norians, consumers can call 1-800-N-O-U-R-I-A-N-Z or go to www.norians.com. Brought to you by Kiowa Kieran. And that's Viewpoints for this week. Viewpoints is a production of Media Tracks Communications. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about upcoming shows. And find a library of past programs on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and more information about our guests at viewpointsradio.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Viewpoints. Coming up next week... This is our first in-car system that has AI processing to be able to do license plate reads right from the in-car camera. The rapidly changing realm of police technology. Then... How can we do good as well as doing well? The balance between revenue and being environmentally responsible. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in-depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints.